Okay, we're on to council initiated discussion. I think you've all seen this before. Uh, this is where we turn the microphones over to the council members and we ask you for any requests that you may have for future reports that would be made at future council meetings or if you're aware of problems or concerns in the research field that you, should, you think should be brought to our attention. So the floor is open and we're all ears. While people are thinking about it, I, just as a preview and just thinking about the next council meeting or two, I did wanna bring to council's attention that at the May council meeting, we'll, um, we will consume, ooh, I don't know, maybe at least an hour and a half or so of the open session for a bit of a uh, once a decade kind of a deep dive into our intramural research program. I announced this, uh, I think last May actually, but but Gail and Lynn are co-chairs of a blue ribbon panel um, that will take a once in a decade um, look at our intramural program. Now council spends 99% of its time worrying about the extramural program and they don't, but, but this is a very high level look that is asked to be done on an, every intramural program once every 10 years. So Lynn and Gail will be presenting the recommendations from that group and in addition to that coupled to it, we will have a, a, just a general overview of the intramural program by our scientific director, Charles Rotimi, who has never presented to council. And we try to get the scientific director uh, just giving just updates, you know, every so you know, every year-ish or every year to two years. And so we're gonna couple those together in May. So that'll be part of the open session in May. But we would love your suggestions about other things you might wanna hear about. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, um, I know that we have, or not we, I guess we as big NIH uh, has a, a, the new uh, NCI director, uh, Monica Bert Agnoli. Okay, yeah. uh, I was wondering if we could get her on the agenda before everyone else does. So, yeah. you know, start building relationships there and think through what we could uh, hear about her ideas in terms of genomics, uh, applications of even like the pan genome to, uh, to understanding cancer mutations and better treatment, uh, ways of getting more money out of the NCI. <laughs> we, we, will, we will put her on the list. I, I, she's been very public about the fact that she's facing some health challenges right now, so you, I, her schedule is particularly challenging, but we could think about if not in May, we could aim for September, but we will, we will add that yeah. to the list. Thank you. Okay, Mark and then Laura. So this doesn't pertain to um, requests or future meetings, but it's more of a, a issue that's emerging, I think. And that is that I think for all of our relevant graduate programs that stipends are going up at a pretty good clip, and the issue that worries me a bit is just the gap between the NIH graduate student stipend that's paid on training grants and what we actually pay our graduate students is growing. And, um, and that's a particular concern for training grants where we can't just pay off the grant the student at the normal stipend, right? And moreover, our hands are a bit tied in that we can't use federal funding to make up that gap. And so that now puts pressure on investigators and departments and universities to try to, 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 to fill that gap. I know um, even with the new NIH stipend here for most of our grad programs, that gap is about $7,000 a student per year and likely to grow too. And th this is of course an NIH wide issue, right? Yeah. Does anybody want to speak to this? Uh, we can certainly have it on the list to discuss. I see a couple people going to microphones. Betty, you want to comment or Vince? Well, like the that. only thing I can say is that Congress decides what the stipend level is, not NIH. So I think in order to get change, this is one of the things that we cannot do here at NIH. It's it's something that we have no control over. Does anybody know about that? I, I actually thought we, Deanna, please come to the microphone. I wasn't sure that was 
true. I thought, so, at least from the, in the intramural side, I know we said it, but maybe on the extramural side they don't. But Deanna, what do, what do we know? So there was a, uh, is this on? It's not. It's not. Okay. Deanna, if you, if you could feel free to come okay. maybe sit next to Vince and grab that microphone and I'm sure someone will get a camera on you. Okay. So there was a report done many years ago by the OIG and it was a special report where they went in and looked at the University of California and what they were paying their graduate students versus their postdocs. And what they found is the graduate students were being paid far and above more than a postdoc was for the same amount of work. So they put into place a rule that the postdoc zero stipend level is the limit that we can provide to graduate students for total compensation that includes stipend, tuition and fees, everything. That's our limit, is the zero level. And we can't change that. That was a determination made years ago and what we follow. I was just going to ask uh, Dr. Hendorf, Lucia Hendorf, to maybe make some comments. She's on the uh, training advisory committee for NHGRI. Yes, thanks. I, I don't have much to add to what Betty said, actually. So I think that the stipend levels are set at a level much higher than NHGRI can establish. But I do know that um, I can report that the training advisory committee, which is the NIH-wide committee of um, training extramural program staff, has been discussing this a lot. Um, the other thing I would note is that this is an area where I think you know, from from being on the outside and now more on the inside, progress has been very incremental. I can say that the decision to add um, childcare stipends, you know, even though they're very modest, was you know just a huge shift in the way that um, trainee trainee support was viewed. So I I think we should look into how to share more of that information with council, but I, I do think that the actual um, ability to affect larger change is going to be limited. Okay, Laura, go ahead. I wanted to advocate for another institute director with um, NCATS and Joni Rutter taking on that new position and with the potential that this could help with uh, clinical translation. I think it's a great suggestion. I'm sure Joni would love the opportunity. Judy, go ahead. Um, yes, I would endorse the Joni Rudder idea. Uh, getting back to kind of trainee salaries, uh, just something to put on people's radar um, is the increasing unionization of postdocs. Um, you know, the Mount Sinai postdocs voted to unionize. We're in negotiations for a collective bargaining agreement. Columbia has already established that. So there is another stakeholder to consider in the future. Iftikhar. Yeah, thanks, Rudy. I think Eric mentioned this new policy where um, any scientific reports, papers coming out of federal funding have to be open access uh, relatively quickly. So does that mean that uh, publication fees will may need to be budgeted in the grants <laughs> applications? I am not the one to try to answer this. I don't know. I don't. Uh, I don't know who is necessarily. But what I will say is, this is um, certainly appreciated to be an equilibrium disturbing development that's going to have to be sorted out, which is going to involve a combination of how the publishers are going to handle this and how NIH is going to have to handle it. And there's a lot of. Um, I think there's a lot of debate and maybe to some extent uncertainty exactly how this is going to fall out. I know there's a lot of meetings taking place to try to to sort of to figure this out a little further. Anybody have more insightful answers than that? Well, I don't know how insightful. Um, and Deanna may want to comment, but publication costs have been uh, appropriate in in grants uh, in grant budgets in the past. This is just another 
form of a publication cost, albeit a, a much higher one. Um, so I would think they could be up. Are you getting up, Deanna? Or <laughs> no? We, sorry, say again. We provide what's asked. We don't question the cost. Right. So you're saying you provide what's asked. What's, what's, provide what's, what's asked. What's asked. But of course, what's going to what's happening now in the ecosystem of journals is huge disparities as to what the costs are, what's involved. You know, and it's really creating this incre incredibly intense debate around you know the value of journals, the role of journals, and. And you know who should be paid, you know, and should peer reviewers get paid? I mean, it is just uh, getting a, you know a, an incredible discussion at every nook and cranny of the publishing ecosystem. And this, uh, you know, to me, this is just one more perturbation. This has been going on starting with you know PLOS and everything. I mean, this is just this is just a continuation, and preprints and everything else. And I don't know where it's going to all land, but. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, I guess my own opinion. I mean, at the end of the day, it does make sense that we sh have public money going for public research, the results of which should be publicly available. And we have to figure out how to pay for it. I'm going to bring this to a close. I don't see anyone racing for their mute button, so thank you very much. We will digest this and at least bring some of this back to you at May Council. And beyond. <laughs>